Hi everybody, it's Jason again from the Children's Museum, the ACE Dean Program Manager, and this time we're going to continue our talk on forensic science. Doing an activity that's actually done a lot in forensic scientists is called chromatography. Basically chromatography is separating mixtures so that we can see color signatures or patterns be after the mixture has been separated. Now, chromatography is dealing with fluids, and I want you to remember something. Fluids are not just liquids, they're also gases. So there's liquid chromatography and there's gas chromatography. Now some cases of liquid chromatography would be inks and blood and other things like that. And gas chromatography would be if there was gunpowder present at the scene. You can use gas chromatography to actually figure out the caliber of the gun which gun was used, and even when it was fired, they can see how long ago it had been fired. So when you're looking at chromatography, don't just think of it as liquid chromatography. You can also think of it as gas chromatography, any kind of fluid. Now, the way in which chromatography works is capillary action. It basically separates the pigments in these inks by the weight of the pigment. So the lighter pigments will flow quicker and move up, like say a filter paper, much faster than the more dense or heavier uh, pigments would. So we're gonna look at how this works and we're gonna do a comparison of different inks. Now the way we're kind of spinning this with our crime scene uh, evidence is we found a receipt at the crime scene. And by using chromatography, we actually separated the inks and found these signatures here, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and Take, we took four receipts that were found within the pockets of the suspects, or better yet, you can go to the actual store and take a new receipt so you don't have to actually ask the suspect, hey, if you have a receipt of this or whatnot, because they might deny it, they might throw it away or whatnot, to see where it could, where whatever was bought was bought, okay? And then we can say, oh, maybe this person was there because they do a certain thing. Remember the circumstantial evidence, how it goes with the scientific evidence? That's how we work this out sometimes. So if, say, the, one of the crime suspects is really into cooking, maybe the receipt we found was from a bakery or from a restaurant or from a shop that sells unique sort of baking goods, okay? At the end of this one, you're going to see one of the problems of forensic science. And I'm not going to tell it to you until the end. So for now, let's just see how we're gonna do the experiment. Give me one second. I got four cups here. I'm gonna fill each cup with some water. Okay, we got four cups full of water. If you notice, I have four different pins. These are the pens or the inks that we are substituting for receipt ink, just for the practical purpose of doing this experiment. We also have filter paper. Our filter paper is cut up coffee filters. What we're gonna do for each one of these, we're gonna put a number on the top. One, two, three, or four. I'm just gonna start with one. I'm only gonna do one of these because of the time it takes. You can do the rest. Once you get number one on, you're gonna pick a pen. You're gonna pick a pen at random because the pens themselves are not numbered. You might start to see where the problem with this one's gonna come in in a second. So I'm gonna pick this one right here. You're gonna make a mark on your filter paper about one third up from the bottom, the opposite side of where you put your number one or your number two, your number three, your number four. Can be kind of a thick mark but you just wanna make sure you get it marked all the way across. Now here's the tricky part of forensics, or of this activity. When you put it inside the water, you have to be careful that you don't submerge the line. If you submerge the line, you actually tamper the evidence, or you contaminate the evidence, because it doesn't have time to separate the different pigments out. So you have to be, let it, flow very slowly through. So when you put this inside the water, you wanna make sure 
that you go just below the line of the ink and allow it to go ahead and filter its way through the water. It'll move up. As you can see, it's already starting to do what it's supposed to do. Now, this takes a while. You want to give it a few minutes, okay, to allow it to flow upwards, to allow it to separate the pigments, all that good stuff. Once you're done with all four, down here you have receipt one, receipt two, receipt three, receipt four. You can go ahead and use the crayons that we give you to go ahead and mark out what they all look like. Now here's the problem. The pens were not marked one, two, three, and four. So you could pick a number one and someone else could have a completely different number one. So in order to match up to a suspect would be very difficult. We did this on purpose to show you that sometimes it's really hard to match scientific evidence to someone based upon a single piece of evidence. What you want to do when you're matching up evidence is to match up multiple pieces of evidence to a person or persons. Okay? So when you're done with this experiment and you're looking at all these different receipts, you'll find one that has the same signature as this. But a group next to you might have receipt one as that signature, you might have receipt two. And if that was suspect one was receipt one and suspect two was receipt two, then you might think, well, I think suspect two did it, I think suspect one did it, and then it becomes a little jumbled up. You would have to use further evidence, maybe some circumstantial evidence to get that one across. Like, okay, maybe this suspect had this, but they're not really interested in this, so maybe it was planted on them. Let's say like we said about the baking. You have a suspect who doesn't cook at all. Maybe the suspect slipped the receipt into their pocket or their purse or their wallet. Something like that to actually take the crime away from them. So sometimes forensic evidence, the scientific evidence, has to match circumstantial evidence in order to make a better case. And that's why we did it this way on this one. The next one, though, is very, very good evidence against a single person or maybe two people. And you'll see why, because in the next activity, we do match circumstantial evidence with scientific evidence to give you that idea. All right, we're done with this activity. Thanks a lot, guys.